great singing choir. Why don't you join me in standing and let's sing all together now. Page 413, or look up on the screen there. Love lifted me. How many of you are thankful for love this evening? All right, sing like it. On the first, now I was sinking. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking through rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now saved. Jesus and nothing else would do nothing but the blood of Jesus that's what we're singing about when we're singing this song that's an awesome thought we got two more verses let's make them count now on the third nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not a This is all my 
That's the entire argument of the book of Hebrews is why would you go back to something that cannot save? Why would you go back to the law, to works, when the blood of Christ has already been spilled, already been shed to take away our sin? Good to see you tonight. And i got a full crowd inside the wings. I like that. And the full up tonight. Praise the Lord for you being here. Do we have anybody? This is your first time or first time in a long time. And it looks like most everybody's home for it. I think young man back here, good to have you, sir. And uh, others, if you'd slip your hand up, just hold it for a moment. One of these good ushers would come back to you. Good to see Jet up here tonight. Other guests, we're so glad that you're here. And uh, thankful for being in the service. Had a good start this morning. A uh, good day. We praise the Lord for that. And uh, looking for a good week. Sunday is the first day of the week. You realize now uh, we don't end where we start right here. This is just the kickoff. And what are we going to do this week? We're going to tell someone about the Lord. We're going to lift somebody's spirit, encourage somebody, help somebody, uh, strengthen somebody, maybe uh, step in the gap for somebody. You don't know. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking to prepare us uh, through tonight's service, the preaching of the Word of God, for the work that He has laid out for us this week. There's no telling what divine appointment you'll keep this week that you're not even aware of yet, but you can intervene in somebody's life. And we're excited about that. Lord, we love you. And thank you for bringing friends to us tonight. Thank you for bringing our home folks here. And Lord, we pray that you'd be blessed. You'd be pleased. You'd be honored with all that's said and done in this place. And the Lord, I pray that you'd have your will and your way. And God, do a work in here that only you can do in our heart. And as we preached about this morning, the preaching is one thing, but the hearing is another. And Lord, help us to surrender areas of our life that yet are not in full and complete control to Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for our sick and our struggling, and we pray for those that are yet to come to know you, Savior, Lord, that even today would be a good day, that you would be uh, found for, for those that are lost, as you are available to anyone who will call on you for salvation. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to help others in Christ's name. Amen. You be seated. Listen as the choir sings.
Amen. Amen. All right, I want Brother David Hall to come and we'll have our missions moment for the week. Uh, you ever thought about this? We can't prove this from Scripture, but you know the angels were anxious to move. Uh, the angels were anxious to defend the Lord. And uh, the Lord said, no, this is what he was sent to do. This is what he went to do. And he could have called them and could have changed everything, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't stop it. They let it happen. And I just saw the other day one of uh, this, uh, a, uh, uh, I think Kevin Sorbo, he's an actor. He got into some trouble because he made the statement, the Jews didn't kill Jesus. Jesus gave his life. And uh, they, of course, Fuhrer and all that, the, po the police, the speech police hit him pretty good. But uh, nobody killed him. The Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't. He laid down his life. Now, on the third day, he took it up again. Amen. But he laid it down. So anyway, choir, you may be seated. Brother David, you come on. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I'm going to do something a little different today. We're going to have two missionaries this week. And it, not that they're less important, but they're two retired missionaries. And to be honest, I just don't have a lot of information on them. But I will give you what I got. Uh, the first one is Stella Mayo. And uh, her and her husband shall be around the field for 42 years. In fact, the two people I'm going to talk about tonight, 90 years, over 90 years combined ministry and service on the mission field. Uh, and they were missionaries in Singapore, New Zealand, and Indonesia. And as of 2002, Brother Shelby actually started a 2 Timothy 2.2 based on discipleship in Hawaii. And uh, she's out of Pastor Wiley's church, right up the road here, preacher. So uh, that's a blessing. And uh, Stella has since moved up to Ohio with one of her children, so she's living there. And also, I'm going to give you Miss Audrey Norton. Um, we're, a lot of us know Brother Norton. Uh, he used to come to our church every so often, uh, Jim and Audrey. And uh, they have started seven churches uh, in Japan since they ministered there. I believe he passed uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken. And they have over 49 years of service on the field. And he also took many evangelistic trips to the Philippines and South Korea. Many, many souls were saved. I think of Brother Morton, Norton, I think of a soul winner. And I don't know, thousands or ten thousands, but and he also was a big poetry buff. If you ever met him, he always was giving you a poem or something to read. So uh, he's one of the sweetest, uh, meekest people I've, you ever want to meet. And she's also living up north, I believe, in Michigan. But, you know, as I look at these people, and I don't know them that well, but I think they would it be... Uh, quick to agree that they were nobody special. All they did was make themselves available. And God said, you made yourself available, I'm going to use you. And you know, I, I can't help but think their husbands are looking down from glory and say, you know what, no regrets, no regrets. And church, church I want to challenge you tonight to go forward and not to have any regrets as we serve him until he takes us or until he returns. Amen. One thing that we do is after a missionary couple retires, uh, we want to continue their support. Many of them do not have retirement type plans. And uh, so we keep, so not maybe at the same level, but uh, keep supporting them, be faithful, honor them because of their service. And uh, Brother, Jim, Jim, Brother Jim was a uh, poet warrior because he was faithful to the cause of Christ, but a, a very uh, prolific writer. And I had the privilege to meet him way back in college. Uh, he was a Midwestern man up there out of, out of Pontiac. And uh, I miss him. I think, I think about just a picture of model missionary work. Brother, Brother uh, Norton, just faithful, faithful, and uh, love the Japanese people. What about, I wish you, if you, it, it's so sad to me. We know so many that these young people will never get to know. And uh, you wonder who's going to be their heroes, who's going to be the men and women that we look to and say, oh, old doctor so-and-so, old brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he was one of those kind of guys. So. Uh, maybe some of you young men will fill his shoes on the mission field. Praise the Lord. Let's do this. Let's stand together. Choir, you come and find your place. You find uh, some room out there. Spread out and uh, find your place. Say hello to somebody. God bless you. We're glad you're here.
All right, if you want to make your way there back to your seat, you can turn to page 56 or look up on the screen there. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Sing out on the first with me. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll change. is glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will please Bible, the book of Ephesians. You may be seated. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. We're going to get right into our text tonight. And uh, <clears throat> right to the sermon, Ephesians chapter 4. While you're turning there to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, if you use an old Schofield Bible, that's page 1253. Uh, let me say a word about Saturday, uh, our ministry workers' uh, service. If you're involved in ministry, you need to be there. Uh, it's very important for us. It's very important for you. Uh, we'll be sharing some ministry philosophy that night. Also, some just practical instructions. So please, if you haven't signed up, do so. Make sure uh, that you, uh, we know you're coming. And then let us have opportunity to feed you. We're going to give you a great meal and a great time together this Saturday night. And then Sunday, uh, the new members luncheon. If you haven't been to the new members class, uh, you need to go to that. That helps you know where we stand and for us to know uh, where you stand. And you say, well, we don't agree on this or that. 
uh, we, we're not for everybody. We, we, don't, we understand that. Uh, but we're for those that God brings us. The Lord puts people in the church uh, that needs to be here, and so we'll be on the same page. We have a great task. The world evangelism is before us, and uh, we don't need to spend time debating and arguing. Uh, we're settled on some things. We believe some things. And uh, that class is a very friendly class, a wonderful answering time for you. Uh, and if, uh, if somebody says, well, preacher, I, I'd feel much more comfortable at such and such a church. I'll help you find it. Honest to goodness, I want you to find a church that you belong to and fit in. And uh, don't be at a place that you're miserable. Uh, some of us have to do that uh, at other places. Our job, uh, maybe where we live, what have you. But uh, you ought not be miserable at church. Amen. And ought to be at home here. So that new members class. Now, before we read our actual text, I want to read three places in the Word of God that give us the command, thou shalt not steal. The first one's found in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and verse number 15. And, of course, that's a pretty good list of commandments right there, all right? And right there, the Bible says what? Thou shalt not steal. All right, so in the Old Testament, God told his people, don't steal. Now, we come to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, and verse 18. Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not. So in the Old Testament, God said, don't steal. Now Jesus said, thou shalt not steal. Now we come to the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse number 9. And here the apostle Paul writing to the church. And the apostle Paul says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not. Three different times. Old Testament, time of Christ, New Testament. The Bible gives us a direct command to, to, to steal, to not steal, uh, a direct command to not steal. Now, why do you suppose in the Old Testament, in the time of Christ, and the New Testament, God had to reiterate the command, do not steal? People because people were stealing. People were stealing. This is a universal problem. This is, a uni this is a problem of mankind. It's not an American problem. It's not a European problem, African problem. This is a worldwide problem. And uh, we look at that and we say, I wonder why God keeps telling us over and over, don't do something, because man disobeys. And from the very beginning, man has been taking that which he did not earn, which did not belong to him. So God says, look, don't steal. Now we come to our text tonight, verse 28. We've dealt with, excuse me, we've dealt with anger, right? We've dealt with lying. We've dealt with giving place to the devil. Now we come to verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let him that stole steal, so more, steal no more. Now, what does this suppose? It supposes, still some more. It's been a long weekend. Give me a break. This supposes what? If he says, let him that steal, steal no more, what's he saying? It's going on. It's going on. So we have an Old Testament command, a command of Christ, and a New Testament command. And Paul said, now wait a minute, guys. Some of you are not listening. Stop stealing. Stop stealing. Now, I wrote this down tonight. Number one, the admonishment to stop stealing. Let him that steal, steal no more. So God says, look, I'm telling you, we've got a problem. Now, if you have been around anybody any length of time, you know this is part of the human condition. You go to the nursery and uh, the kids are taken here. You go to elementary school and all of a sudden somebody's lunch is missing. Uh, you go to junior high, you go to senior high, you go to college. You go to the workplace. You put your lunch in the lunch box. Uh, you bring it to work, put it in the refrigerator, come back for lunch, and it's gone. What happens? Somebody stole. And then we have the great sins of stealing that we see on the news and people breaking and entering. And you say, wow, uh, preacher, I'm not guilty of those big things. But what is it that we really steal? What, tonight, I'm not really worried about anybody breaking in the bank. If you do, and if you're successful, and before you get caught, tithe. <laughs> but I'm not really worried about you committing fraud on the Enron Energy Corporation love line. I don't think that, that we have people like that. But do you know we are guilty of stealing people's things? 
And, and here's the excuse. This was something that Valerie taught me when we began to go to Haiti. The idea in Haiti was, you have two, I have none, therefore it's okay for me to take one of yours because now we'll both have one. And, and that's how we see things here. We, we do that all the time. We see somebody that's uh, uh, okay, that's well off, that has something. And well, you, you, let me just say it this way. Our parents have things we don't. And so they have a few dollars in their purse or wallet, and we don't. So we just pull it out. Because it's okay. They, ha they have plenty. So we just keep it. Or uh, here's, the, here's the money, go into the store, buy the back gallon of milk, come back out, and uh, we have a, a few dollars of change, so what do we do? Now that's, that preacher, that's just normal. Right, because stealing is normal. That's why that's a normal thing, for us to take what doesn't belong to us because it's a normal human condition that we've dealt with from the beginning of time. Obviously, God had to tell us in the first set of commandments. He had to reiterate in the time of Christ and twice to the church. He said, stop taking stuff that doesn't belong to you. What he's saying here is if you don't earn it, it's not yours. We steal stuff all the time. We steal stuff from work. Well, the boss can replace it. One of the great problems in, 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 in uh our, our marketing and our uh, business world is uh, employee theft prevention. I talked to a guy at Target, Target, the big commercial store, the big store, box stores everywhere, and I talked to a guy that was in charge of uh, their, their, their unit to, to mo monitor stealing, and I said, man, you got to really watch the shoplifters, don't you? He said, nope. He said, i got to really watch the employees. He said, man, he said, that's where all of our loss is, employee theft. You know why? Because Target's a big store, and they can rep reproduce it. It won't be a big deal. And, uh, and, 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 and so I'll just take this. It doesn't hurt anybody but the corporation. You're stealing. My father said to me one day, he said, everybody that works for me steals from me. He said, that's just, a, it's just human nature. He said, I only fire those who steal more from me than they make for me. He said, because I've fired everybody that steals. He said, I got bus drivers that'll go fill up their car with a bus card. It's supposed to be for bus fuel. They'll fill up their vehicles. He said, I got, I got people that'll bill expenses uh, to an account that's for their personal family or dinner or whatever, and they'll bill it as a sales call. He said, I have everybody who works for me that steals. He said, the secret is, I just got to find the ones that steal the least. Now, that is a sad comment on the human condition. Right. We steal things. But number two, I want you to notice this. Not only do we steal things, we steal time. We steal time. Do you know that I really don't mind you stealing my things? I can always get more things. But once you steal my time, I can't get more time. When you steal time, I was uh, thinking about how do we steal time. You know, we steal time in school when a teacher is lecturing and trying to help us and we're not paying attention and uh, we're not listening as they try to give us a lesson. You know, the teacher's already graduated college. Uh, they've already got a career. They're not doing this necessarily just for them. They're doing this for you and you're stealing their time and you're stealing other people's time who can't listen when you are not giving attention to what they're saying, when you're disrupting, you're disrupting the teacher, you're disrupting the other students. You know what you're doing? You're stealing everybody's time around you. Right. You know, that's where... We, you know that's where we steal time? In this room right here. We steal time in this room right here. We come together. I want you to get the math on this. Now, I'm not a great mathematician. It's not my strong suit. But we're together, and don't make fun, but I know roughly Sunday morning, Sunday school, uh, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, roughly four hours and a little bit more. I understand that. But preaching time out of those times together is only about 45 minutes. Now, you can go back through my 20 years of history and ministry, and they will tell you that I averaged 43 minutes a sermon. Some more, some less. But, I, I mean, you, you can't laugh at that because we can go and show you from start to finish, besides all the extra stuff, it's 43 minutes. So you have 43 minutes of Word of God time every time we say. Now, Sunday school is less. Sunday school is less. Sunday night's a little bit more. Wednesday night is very much less because we try to cram a lot in in a short time. And when you're not paying attention, 
and disrupted and in and out and up and down and you're bothering everybody around you, you're a stinking thief. You're stealing my time and you're stealing whoever is around you's time because they are distracted, they may have a burden, they may try to get some help, and all of a sudden, your child that you uh, take in and out and in and out, and you're this, and you're talking here and talking there, all of a sudden, you're a time thief. Time thief. You, you take people's time when you ask questions, they give answers, and then you don't listen. We steal a lot of things, don't we? Now, I'm guilty, this is one of those... I'm not going to ever preach on anger again. I'm not ever going to preach on lying again. And now I'm not going to preach on sin again. Because I hate these things because as I look at it, I'm guilty of all of these as well. But folks, I'm telling you, when we come together for church, when we come together for this worship hour, let's not steal each other's time. Amen. You listen, I'll give you the best sermon I can give you that week, Lord willing. Uh, W.A. Crystal said, I'll see you next week with a Bible in my hand and a message from God on my heart. That's my goal every week of my life, to give you something from the Word of God. The least you can do is listen for 43 minutes. You say, preacher, I got a condition. I, man, for those of you, the exceptions to the rule, I get that. But most of us are excuses, not exceptions. And, and, and you, you, you know, I, I was taken out of church a time or two by my mom and dad. I realized it was much better to stay in church than be taken out of church. Much healthier for me to stay in the service than to be taken out of the service. Don't steal time. Don't steal things. Now, what is stealing? The act of stealing. Admonition to stop it four times. The act of stealing. Well, number one, there's just unlawful stealing. Now, unlawful stealing, I wrote that as simple as this. You take something that does not belong to you. As simple as a bottle of water, you take something that you did not earn. Now, that's a sin, that's wrong. You take somebody's cold drink. You take somebody's uh, pen. You take somebody's... Well, you say, well, preacher, it's no big deal. The problem is, what is a big deal? Right. Everything's become such a no big deal, there's hardly any big deals left. When, I really think this may be the problem. I think we've so lessened the little things that we have no more major things. We, we keep saying, well, it's not that big a deal. Oh, just a chicken sandwich here or a chicken sandwich here. But if you did the math on that, I'm sure you have done it, that's thousands of dollars in inventory over the year for just one person. Multiply that times 50 employees. Multiply that times, you know, uh, how many ever. You know, we, we think about the church. We think about our tithes and our offering. You say, well, I don't tithe. Well, multiply you not tithing for 12 months times everybody else not tithing for 12 months. Wherein have you robbed me, God said? Right. Tithes and offerings. Right. Well, it's no big deal that I don't give to God. Well, multiply that out. When we take things, when you don't tithe or give back to God, you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. The tithe, the Bible says, belongs to the Lord. So when we take things, it's not ours to begin with. We're stewards of that. And we're to give back that. We're not to take that which doesn't belong to us. I don't want to be caught with anything that belongs to anybody else, much less God's. Right. Number two, not only is it unlawful to take someone's things that does not belong to us, but stealing is when it's unscrupulous. I like that word. I had to look that one up. <laughs> unscrupulous. And this means cheating in measurements Weight, quality, or value. Now, I, I, this one right here, I do understand this one. I'm a terrible car salesman because, man, I, I, I just, when I have to sell a car, I, I hate the idea of not being honest. But almost to sell a car, you just, you can't be, I didn't say that. Somebody else out there said it. You can't be too honest. I mean, really, to tell them everything you know is wrong with it, every little sound, every little this. Uh, well, you know, uh, this is high quality. Well, why does it say made in China? Well, no, 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 I'm just kidding. It's, a, it's an original made in China. It's an original made in China. But unscrewed, when we know something and we don't divulge that. You know, I found out a few years ago, I started buying houses, we moved around. I found out you have to divulge if somebody died in that house or not. I didn't know that until I started buying a house. Uh, that's something I don't need to know, by the way. Uh, that would not be, but, but if it happened and you don't tell somebody, oh, man, you're in trouble. 
because, you know, they, they want you to know everything about that house. And I've bought enough houses and stuff now. I've bought enough cars now. I'm glad when people do tell me the truth because eventually it's going to come out anyway and you're going to be either excited or disappointed or what have you. But when we don't tell the truth about a quality or about a weight, oh, yeah, that's genuine solid gold sort of maybe kind of, you know. That's unscrupulous. Now, here's the thing. You hate for that to happen to you, but then we'll turn around and do it to somebody else if it's to our advantage. Unscrupulous, you're stealing there. So, number one, unlawful, just taking that which doesn't belong. Unscrupulous. Uh, number three, unjust. We steal when we're unjust. You say, preacher, how do we do that? Well, when we try to take advantage of someone. Now, I, I, I could get really just passionate about this. I lived in Jefferson County, Texas. It's the home, Beaumont, uh, Beaumont uh, the city of Beaumont, Groves, Port Arthur, and Orange. Now, they called it the Golden Triangle because Port Arthur and Orange and uh, Beaumont form a triangle. Beaumont is the largest city in America. Jefferson County is the largest county in America per capita for lawsuits against corporations. Now, a couple years ago, we had a big tort reform movement tobacco lawsuit, asbestos lawsuit, gun control lawsuit, all of those big multi-billion dollar lawsuits filed in Jefferson County. You say, preacher, why? Because of all the refineries. And the jurors over the years, they have a, a history of giving these large settlements because of the refineries, because these refineries make billions of dollars. So let's file, let's file a tobacco lawsuit. Where are we going to file it? Jefferson County. We don't make any cigarettes in Jefferson County, but we filed there because of the lawsuits. When we live in a country, I just saw this on the internet, it just popped up on the internet, or their Facebook or whatever. It said, you can sue anybody, anytime, for any reason. Click here to find out more. I'm thinking, we've come to the place where if I buy, this, this happened, you know this happened, if I buy a cup of coffee from McDonald's and it spills on me, and burns me, I'm going to sue McDonald's for selling me hot coffee. You say, preacher, that happened, she won. I just want to help you. Coffee's hot. <laughs> now, unless it's called iced coffee, put the preface of ice in front of it. But if, they, if you buy coffee, they put it in a machine, they cook it. Cook stuff's hot, you spill it, hot stuff burns. She needed mental help, not a lawyer's help, all right? But she won that. And, and slip and fall and accidents. And why do you think all these, these lawyers advertise uh, 411, call, before you call 911, call 411? Well, because they want to take anything, whether real or imagined, and they want to sue somebody over it. Right. Now, I'm going to tell you something, that's stealing. That's right. Now, I'm not against, let me say this, I'm not against you going after the insurance to cover your bills, and if you do have pain and suffering, whatever, I'm not against that one bit. I think if somebody does something negligent, they do something harmful, you ought to have the right to that. In fact, let me just tell you this. I encourage a lady in our church to sue our church. She fell at our church. It was a complete accident. She was one of the most faithful workers in our church. She actually fell off the platform and twisted her hand, broke her hand. She had a bad doctor. He, he messed her hand up. She's never been right. And uh, finally, the insurance quit paying on that. They refused. I said, sue us. Now, she wasn't suing the church. She was suing our insurance. I said, sue us. I said, we pay a ton of money for this kind of stuff, and you, you, get, you get your hand fixed. You say, preacher, why? Because that was a legitimate something that insurance is supposed to cover, and the only way that the game is rigged, that if you want to get satisfaction, sometimes you have to do that. But this idea of looking for slip and fall opportunities, looking for easy prey. We, we've got people that, that, that say, uh, you know, well, we were in a little minor fender bender. Well, you owe me a brand new car. You were driving a 1960 Volkswagen. I mean, come on. You know, it was an accident. That's stealing. That's taking advantage of so much, getting something you didn't earn. Now, again, not legitimate lawsuit over an issue. I understand that. If somebody does something wrong uh, and, and the law allows that, understand the difference we're talking about trying to gain by disadvantage now number four let me write this one down unmanageable debt when you knowingly incur debt that you can't manage you're ultimately stealing because eventually you're going to file bankruptcy 
I had a friend of mine tell me I lived by buying a property and then buying another property and as I closed on this property it would pay for that property so I had to buy another property to pay for that property he raised five million dollars he was living large until the bubble burst and then he had nothing but debt no equity and you have to walk away say preacher uh, you're, you're really touchy a subject right here we had to file bankruptcy. We, 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 listen, there's sometimes, I understand, the law is there for your protection. You didn't have a recession. You didn't plan a recession. You had a nice house that you could afford. You didn't get your job taken away or lost. There are times, there are times, there are times. Let me say it a hundred times. There are times you need help. I get that. But when you go out and run up a hundred credit cards to their max, paying 27% interest, there's no way in God's earth you'll ever pay that off. You'll never pay that off. And you're still, you say, well, they can afford it and they deserve it. Listen, I, I think they're evil paying all that percent. I think they're wrong. I, I agree. I don't think that's a good thing. But I'm telling you, nobody put a gun to your head to do it. That's right, right. And as a Christian, your name is ready to be chosen in great riches. And, and you simply can't afford as a Christian to have a testimony of someone that doesn't pay their bills. That's good. So sometimes it's better to say, no, I'll wait or I'll use what I've got a little longer or I'll make do instead of getting out there and getting in trouble and buying a car you know you can't afford. Say amen right there. Amen. Buying a house you know you shouldn't be in. Say amen right there. Amen. You know. And so when we do that, you say, well, preacher, if, if I just file bankruptcy, I'll walk away. No, you're losing your testimony. If it's a fraudulent thing. Now, again, sometimes things happen. Say it a hundred times. But that's stealing. Uh, number five, unfair usury now that's 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 where you do something nice like loan someone some money and say hey look uh, if you went to the bank they make you pay seven percent uh, I'd like to get a return I'm getting five percent why don't you pay me back five percent there is nothing in the world wrong with Christians loaning money to each other I, I, I that's a blessing if you can help but now if you're Guido <laughs> the killer loan shark or if you're Amscot, that's unfair usury. Where you're making, you know what you're doing? You're putting someone into servitude, indentured service. There's no way you'll ever get out from that. The, these, the, the, this Amscot thing, listen, I think, I think technically some states have ruled it illegal what they do. Number one, you can't write a check. You know you don't have money in the bank to cash. That's against the law. And you write them a check, and then you say, well, come and pick this check up and just give me another 50 bucks. Listen, friend, let me tell you something. That's wrong. In some states, the attorney generals are investigating that. Uh, Florida, apparently, everybody and their brother does that. I would personally stay away from there as far as I could stay away. Aaron Rents, Am Scott, these places, what they do is they put you in servitude. They put you in a cycle. You'll never get these payday car lot. Oh, yeah, you got a job, you got a ride. Some of you need to ride on by. Because they put you in servitude. Now, that's one thing for the world to do that. We shouldn't do that to each other. Now, I'm not against making, if somebody wants to sell something, you want to buy it and you get an advantage. I understand that's life. Sometimes you do that. But when we knowingly take advantage of a brother, listen, God was very clear about that. In fact, he said, hey, you know what? Every seven years, wipe everything clean. Walk away. Jubilee, walk away. Because I do not want your brother to be indentured to you over a debt they'll never pay. So after seven years, walk away. No deals past seven years to walk away. And sometimes we find people, oh, I'm helping a brother out. No, dear friend, you're not. You're taking advantage of a brother in a difficult situation. Okay? Number five, un usury. Number six, untrue work ethic. We steal when we do not give what we promise our employer. He hires you for an eight-hour day, a Christian ought to put in an eight-hour week. An eight-hour day. <laughs> Steal some more. Amen. That's, that sermon took a turn right there. If, uh, if an employer hires you for an eight-hour day, he ought to get an eight-hour day out of you. Now, the, the hard thing about being a pastor is uh, I hear back from employers 
uh, people that say, oh, Brother Sam, so I had to let so-and-so go or picture, what do you think about hiring so-and-so or this, that, and the other, and they ask for, I get references. Probably every week in the world I'm giving a reference to somebody. And the, the, the great thing is, oh, thank you, preacher, for sending so-and-so my way. That's the best employee I've ever hired. Uh, it's also very sad to me when I get back the other call, preacher, so-and-so, man, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't get them to show up to work. Preacher, I can't get them to stay on task. Uh, I told, I, I've told this story before, if, I, if, if, you, if you've heard it, just pretend like you like it. But I was uh, at Visual Services Incorporated, VSI, and I was the, uh, uh, one of the supervisors. There were several shift supervisors. It was an, an all-day, all-night kind of operation. And I worked from like 3 o'clock to midnight while I was in college. And the Lord blessed, and I got a position uh, of a manager. And I had the privilege to be over a lot of other guys from the college, Midwestern. We got a lot of guys hired there. And that was a great thing for us, but that was also a negative thing because some of them turned out to be a little lazy and so on and so forth. And so I, I tell my boss, I said, fire them. If they ain't working, fire them. Fire them. I don't care. They won't hurt our feelings a bit if they don't work. And uh, so I got promoted because of that. So, uh, and I was a good worker. But uh, one day they came to me and they said, they said Brent, you've got to talk to these boys, these young preachers. He, they, he said, we, we pay them to answer the phone." We don't pay them to evangelize and to preach. I said, absolutely. We're supposed to do a job, and our job was lease return vehicles. We worked for Ford Motor Company, we worked for Nissan, all these different companies. And, uh, and they said, you need to have a talk with them. So I gathered all the boys in, and I said, gentlemen, I said, uh, we are Christians first and foremost. We serve no king but Jesus. I said, but when we come to work for VSI, we're to give them a full eight-hour payday, and a, a, pay, a full eight-hour shift. And I said, the next one of you that's uh, trying to evangelize or witness or preach or teach on the clock, I am not going to ask them to fire you. I'm going to fire you. Oh, oh, oh. I said, no. I said, now on break and at lunch, and before and after shift, I said, let it roll. But the next track I see on the coffee pot, and that was, we'd go to the break room, there'd be a track on the coffee pot. I'm like, look, I said, the next person I catch taking advantage of our employer, I personally will fire. And a lot of those young guys, they got mad at me. But let me tell you something. We need to have a testimony in the world that a Christian is not afraid to work. Right. By the way, mark this down. Our testimony is already hurting in the world. Because of scandal and issue and trouble, we need to do our best to make it right by doing what we say. If we tell a guy, hey, uh, if Dustin's the tree guy and he says, hey, I'm going to take this tree down for this price, he needs to do exactly like he said, not halfway, a bunch of halfway. A bunch of barely get good. Well, uh, me and Paul were talking the other day, and he said when he used to do uh, uh, pavement work, he said they'd be pretty close to, to right, and one guy would say, come on, get in the truck. I don't see it from my house. And that was the idea. Now, we always used to say it's good enough for government work. Anybody ever heard that? It's good enough for government work. Close enough. No, no, it's not close enough. It ought to be done well. It ought to be done right. And as a Christian, we ought to do our best. Why? Because we're not doing it for our employer. We're doing it for our master. Amen. Whatever our hand finds it to do, what do we do? We're doing it as unto the Lord. We don't work just for them. We work for the Lord. And the Lord used them to give us a job. So I would suggest, I would encourage that we not steal and we put in a full day's work for a full day's pay. Number seven, the last way we steal is when we're able to work but unwilling to work. Just a note here, begging is not a profession. Just a note here, just an idea here, Welfare was never intended to be a lifestyle, but a help. Kind of get back on your feet. Now we have welfare generation after generation who have learned, why in the world would I work when the government will send me a check on the first of the month? Now, by the way, let me just take a moment and teach here. Uh, many of you have retired, and uh, you worked, and you paid in to Social Security. Social Security is what you've already paid in. This, the government right now is trying to tell you that Social Security is like this big pot that they just dip in to give to you out of the kindness of their heart. That's a lie. You put money in that. It's not the, the government doesn't have any money they don't get from you. That, that's your money. If, if you worked those years, you put into it, and now you draw your check. All you're doing is drawing money out that you put in. Hey, every week of the world, they take money out. At some point, we ought to be able to get it back. 
Oh, goodness. But the government makes you feel like they're doing you a big favor by giving you your check. Friend, you worked your life for that check. You worked hard for that check. But this idea of welfare, lazy, can work but won't work, you're nothing more than a thief. I just can't find a job. Now, I'm afraid that's a lie. There's work. I, I, I've, I've seen people carrying lawnmowers, just hauling lawnmowers around, knocking on doors. Hey, I'll mow your grass, 20 bucks. But now, there's not a lot of titles out there. Right. There's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of parking spaces with your name on out there. There's not a lot of managerial positions to start off with, but there's always work to be done. Right. Go find a widow. There's work to be done. A man that won't work is, is an infidel, the Bible says, worse than an infidel, and should not eat. You know what we do? We give them a card. The other day, now this will blow. This, this, this is just one of those other signs that the apocalypse is on us. They are using the welfare card system now to buy medical marijuana. Oh, yeah. I'm like, we have hit the mother load jackpot of stupidity. We are now giving people that won't work marijuana. How in the world are we going to afford the Cheeto bill? I mean, we're giving people that won't work now marijuana. Here, put it on the debit card. Now you say, preacher, what would you do? Get, I'd make them work. Right. I'd certainly make them drug test, praise God. I mean, that's crazy that I work so you can smoke pot. That's about the dumb, uh, that's, that's past stupidity. You say, preacher, I, 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 you know, I, I, I found out that if I, I just milk this unemployment, I can make as much as if I was working. Yeah, but the Bible said work. And when you don't work and you can work, you're a thief. Well, I'm waiting on God. God gave you two legs, two arms, two uh, eyes, two ears. If you're missing any of this, I'm very sorry. But God gave you, <laughs> he gave you the ability to go look for work. We have this idea that God's just going to come show up. Listen, you got to go through the process. You got to apply. You got to step out. And that's a painful process. I, I pray for you every day of my life. There's five or six of our people that are desperately looking, and I'm begging God right now. In fact, we prayed for you by name a few minutes ago. A bunch of our men said, God, give Steve a job. His company uh, downside. He needs work. Listen, I'm for a man that goes to look for work. I'm not for a man that says, well, the government take care of me if I don't work. That's not right. right. By the way, let me just hit this while we're here because now I'm thinking about it. Uh, well, this idea, this idea that we can just grant ourselves to death. I'm for grants, I'm for helps, I'm for that. But at some point, the validity of labor kicks in. Let me cover that. Number three, let me show you why we work. Let me show you the, the, the validity of labor. Let me show you, number three, the uh, alternative to stealing. The Bible doesn't just say in verse 28, don't steal. It says, but rather, let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Now, there's three great truths about working. Number one, labor leads to fatigue. The word means toil, hard work, to be weary. A working man does not have the strength to get in trouble. Right. Right. Work keeps you occupied. Remember when you were a little bitty boy, your mama said, idle hands or the devil's workshop. You know why God wants to, you know why God commanded Adam to work in the garden? Keep him busy. You know what happened when Adam was out working and Eve was kind of taking it easy one day? Satan came in and messed up the whole apple cart. Yeah. Work occupies your mind. If you're not occupied with your mind, have you noticed your mind goes to some crazy places? Right. Some crazy ideas? Work Keeps you occupied to be weird. You say, well, preacher, uh, you don't work hard because you don't do what I do. I, I'm on the end of a shovel all day. I drive a backhoe. I drive, I labor, I work hard. Well, there's many kinds of mental, physical fatigue. And some days I would love, oh, with all my heart, I would love to be behind the wheel of a truck going for a three-day trip across the country, just me and a load of potatoes, I learned a long time ago, potatoes, hey, potatoes don't talk back. 
potatoes do what you stay in the truck. They don't say a word. They just get in there. Boy, I'd love to, to drive across the country and not have to get ready in the morning to go teach uh, eight young men the art of preaching. And already now as I gear down from this message, i got to gear up for that. Hey, mentally, I'm, I'm telling you, you can get to a place crazy trained, fatigued, wore out, pulled, emotionally. And then just pure physically. There's days that I just want him to go run a lot. Because I don't, I don't want him to have energy at night. Your, I just don't know what to do with my kids. I tell you what to do. Take them to work. Number one, work, labor, physical exertion. Number two, he says let him labor. Let him physically exert himself. And then he says not only labor, but work. Now this means to be engaged with, to commit to, to minister about, to trade that which is good or create something. Or create something. There is a value, not just to physical work, there is a value to accomplishing something. I'm going to show you a simple principle. You feel better. Now this is as simple as I can make it. You go outside, the grass is eight inches tall. You cut the grass, the grass is now three inches tall. I guarantee you there's not a man in here that doesn't feel better. Bless God, we have made tall grass short. <laughs> now, that is a small accomplishment, but that is an accomplishment. You've done something. You can point to that and say, I have done that. I have weed eated. I have trimmed. There was raw chicken. Now there's a chicken sandwich. I have done this. <laughs> Amen, right? And I will now eat this. Praise God. Uh, ladies, I love you so much. There is value and accomplishment when you walk into a laundry room with this much laundry and you come out and there's maybe this much laundry. But, but there is value. You say, hey, what would you do? I got the laundry done. Praise God. You have accomplished something. Mentally, all of a sudden, you're saying, hey, I'm valuable because I've done something worthwhile. You say, that's silly. All I did was wash the dishes. You accomplished something. Do you know, do you understand, there are people that go through much of their life and never accomplish making tall grass short? They never accomplish making laundry disappear. They don't produce anything. No wonder their mind is a mess. They have nothing they point to and say, hey, look what I have done. Look what I have accomplished. God created us to be creative people. Amen. He wants us to say, hey, I've done this. Why do your kids, let me ask you a question, all right, logically. Why do your kids come home showing you every paper they've ever drawn, every grade they've ever made, because they have validity that they have done something. It's as simple as putting colors on a paper, and you and I both know it don't mean anything, but to them it's the Mona stinking Lisa. Because they've accomplished something. Some of us need to realize it is not what work we do, it is that we work that matters. We we, we, look, I've done something. I've, I've made, I've created something. I've made a, a dirty tree look good. I've made a, a yard look better. I've made a house look better. I've painted something. I've cleaned something. I've rebuilt something. I've made numbers fit. So preacher, that doesn't get, yes, because God wires us all different. And we find something that we're good at. We find something we do. And all of a sudden, we get validity from working. Number three. Why do we work? Well, we work to labor, to get tired, to get exhausted so that we don't get in trouble. We work to create something. Well, number three, what does he say the last part of the verse? Work, labor that we can give to others in need. We labor to help others. One of the reasons that, that Valerie coupons is to help others. Come on, come to the house. And we, men, missionaries, we, and I'll never forget the first time we had... Uh, the ones down in Peru, our Earnhardts, they came out to the house. We sent them home with, they have a big fan. We sent them home with eight or nine Publix bags of deodorant and shampoos and razors and all that stuff. That You know, those of you that come to our house and you laugh because we got 900 bottles of Skin Fantastic deodorant, whatever. Well, yeah, but you know what? 
when those missionaries come through and that's just something else they ain't got to buy. Man, that's... That, I, now, I hate it when she coupons. I hate the whole process of couponing. But, buddy, when we load up those missionaries, I walk around like King Tut, who has just discovered, yes, sir, we have, they're so proud to have you. And, man, it feels so good. Now, you work hard. That's not fun. But, boy, when you get to be a blessing to somebody, when you, get, when you get to be a giver, not a taker, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Hey, have you figured that one out yet, friend? It's better to be on the giving side than the taking side. Man, when we're able to say, hey, look, we, God's been good. This whole thing with adoption. Do you know why we're adopting? Why not? God's been good to us. Amazing blessings. Here's a little old kid that's literally on the street, Highway 19. Picked him up at, they, they picked him up right over here. What, why not? My kids are great. Love them so much. Our house is a happy home. We're blessed. Man, I, I'm so glad that I'm not the one they're taking the kid from. I'm not the one that I'm struggling with drug problem or can't. Man, why not give? Oh, it's hard. Now, it's hard. I'm not kidding you. Today was terrible. We're starting all over. And I'm not ready. For, I mean, mentally, it's crazy. That kid can poop. <laughs> but you know what? He runs in here and says, Daddy! Hey. We labor. I'm going to give him something. I'm going to give his brother something. I'm going to give his other brother something. I'm going to give, give his new brother something. We labor. Well, I'm going to give you something. Working, studying. I was working on this message yesterday in between the Georgia laws. Gosh. And uh, I'm working. But now, you know what? I'm giving you something that will help you maybe tomorrow that you, those who steal, steal no more. Amen. And instead of stealing, you work to produce. So you can say, hey, come on. Let me take you on. And, uh, let me just say this. God puts you in a church to help others, you know, and, and I, we have great examples. I will not give any of them. But we have great examples of people that use their resources, their positions to help others. That's, that's the way God intended this thing, you know, be a blessing, be benefactors to others. So we labor, we work, why? So we can give. It's more blessed to give. When that offering plate comes by, that's the joy of giving. Thank you, Lord, for a job that I can give back. And now that money can be used in the gospel ministry, the bus ministry, the missionary program, whatever it is. The, t the school, we have the largest school we've ever had. Uh, well, not the, quite, we had one class a little bit larger, but we have a great school this year. And uh, there's so many great things happening on our heroes last week. I mean, you know, those trophies, somebody had to buy, somebody had to buy that. Guess what? You did. That was your tithes and offerings, bought that. And here that grown man's up there bawling like a baby. Listen, that was, that was something that you gave to. We work, we labor to give. Let him that steal, steal no more. Don't steal each other's time. Don't steal each other's things. Don't steal from the Lord. Don't rob God. And in fact, work, labor, so that we might give to those who have need. Father, I pray you'd help us tonight. This Ephesians 4 section of verses has been just terribly pointed to us and the lord whether it's the lying the anger the giving place to the devil now the stealing lord you're just de dealing with us in, in specific areas and so god tonight i pray that we would not be thieves of your time of others things lord of your uh, talents that you've given us Lord. there's so many things we can steal from you i pray that god we would not do that but lord that we would work we'd labor to develop those that we might be beneficial to others, I pray. Heads are about eyes are closed. I'll ask you to stand with me. Heads are about eyes are closed. Just a time of prayer, a time of invitation. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, you need to be saved. You need to trust Christ. The greatest gift ever given was salvation through the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Him as your Savior, I'd plead with you tonight to step out of your place. Let somebody take an open Bible and show you how to be saved. If you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, there's an area in my life. and You say, I don't want people to think I'm a thief. Listen, all of us are thieves in one way or the other. All of us have done things in that area. And you say, I don't want to go for it. I don't want people thinking about that. Listen, when you stop worrying about people, you'll start living. You stop worrying about people, you'll start really living. But if God's dealing with you, maybe you need to go to your boss tomorrow and say, You know what, boss? My attitude's been a little sorry lately. 
haven't been giving you eight hours, 12 hours like I should. Maybe you need to go to your teacher and say, man, I'm going to plug in. I'm going to listen. Whatever it is, Jonathan sings, why don't you step out of your place? If the Lord's speaking to your heart, why don't you come? Let him that steals, steal no more. Verse, you step out of your place, you come. Father, I pray you'd help us tonight as we look at our life. These kind of sermons, they are certainly pointed. They are certainly directed. And Lord, there's areas that we need to look at or we, where we need to be. And Lord, I know that uh, all of us, everyone, myself, our staff, our deacons, our faithful, faithful men and women, every one of us have areas. Lord, I'm sure that we would say this area is not quite where it ought to be. Going back again, the, the anger, the lying, the giving place to the devil, and now this matter of stealing, taking that which does not belong to us. And many times we do it without even knowing it. It's just become part of the, the natural habit, the human condition. And Lord, may we just think about it. That's all I'm asking. May we just think about it before we do it. Lord, give us the victory to make some changes, some, some steps that we certainly need to consider. So much more that should be said, could be said about it. But Lord, I pray. I pray you bless the offering as we give. May our people be generous, cheerful givers. And Lord, do that. I'm so thankful that we get to to give, Lord, to give back, to, to be faithful in that. Lord, I know Brother Dory brought a lesson on giving the other day, just telling people, teaching people and the seniors about the joy of giving. Lord, I pray you bless our gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Ask our ushers to come. We will receive the offering uh, and uh, be faithful in your regular giving. I appreciate those of you that are. Uh, it is uh, how we do things. We don't do bingo. We don't do special things. Uh, we give, and so as the Lord has blessed you, uh, you give back. God bless you as you give. All right, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I want to remind you about the ministry worker meeting this Saturday. 
at um, 5 o'clock this Saturday at 5 o'clock. If you make sure if you're involved in any ministry whatsoever, make sure you're there for that. If you didn't sign up this morning at Sunday school, please call the office and let us know that you're going to be there so we can plan for the meal and things. Uh, then also make sure you, if you're a new member, uh, make sure you sign up out in the information booth for the new members luncheon as well. Uh, tonight we have our teen afterglow. We're doing a super speed game night uh, and multitude of snacks. I don't know what else to call it. But if you're a teenager, uh, if you have a teenager that you think would be in, interested in that tonight in the, after the service, after the uh, Sunday school teachers meeting, we're going to meet right over in the fellowship hall. We're going to be over there. Parents, if you guys want to come and just hang out, uh, I know that normally these things might go a little bit longer, but I know tonight's a school night. We're not going to be a long, super long activity. Uh, but you guys can come over there and hang out with us and just watch them. It's going to be a crazy fun time. Uh, also, we have our teen activity on the 27th at 6.30, Life Size Clue. We're going to play Clue here in the church, all over the auditor, all, all over the entire building. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, uh, let me know. Teenagers, ten, cost us $10 at 6.30 on September the 27th. And then tonight after the service, we also have a Sunday school teachers meeting, and that is uh, immediately following the service for all Sunday school teachers and officers. All right, just a couple other things. Tomorrow night we have a softball game at 7 o'clock down here at Woodlawn, field number 5. If you play, if you can be there at 6.30, that would be great. Uh, the 26th of this month we have a hockey game, and we'll be leaving here at 6.30. If you've not signed up, see myself or Miss Alina Ramperside polka dot night in 226, and that will be a blessing. Then if you work in the teen bus class on Wednesday nights, we're going to have a brief meeting here just immediately after the service, just before uh, the Sunday school meeting. If you could meet right here in the West Wing, uh, that would be a blessing, Pastor. Plethora of snacks. Plethora of snacks. Just was thinking of another, just thinking of another word there. Gang of snacks. Absolutely. Two things, real quick. Uh, on the chairs, appreciate again. Leave them gang together, hook together. That helps us out in cleaning up. And then when we like tonight is great. Everybody spread out. But especially on Sundays, uh, if we can learn to uh, compact in and uh, leave the outside for guests. This morning we had some folks looking for seats and things. So uh, especially on Sunday mornings, if we can come into the middle and leave the outside for those coming late. And then one last thing about the chairs, uh, offering envelopes. We decided not to buy uh, the uh, back. There was an option you could have put a little pouch on the back. We decided not to do that. What we found is when we put the envelopes out, they disappear and they don't get back to us. People write notes on them. Uh, people use them for spit candy or whatever. So here's what we've decided to do. In the track racks, and there's track racks at every entrance, is an offering envelope section. And so if you want an offering envelope, uh, you can get from the track rack. Or simply ask an usher, say, I'd like a track, uh, a track. I'd like an offering envelope, and they will get one to you. But they are around the building in the offering envelopes. That way, if you want to use it to record your giving, that's great. Uh, but we don't use them for spit paper and gum wrappers and notes and grocery lists and whatever else, all right? So very, 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 very quick. Uh, I'm not going to do, I have a long lesson. I'm not going to do a long lesson tonight. But I do want to talk to you about our Missions Emphasis Sunday. So all teachers and workers uh, hit these two meetings very, very quickly. Uh, Valerie leaves tomorrow with Miss Linda. Miss Linda's in the back there. And uh, you pray for them. They're going to go do some training for foster care, medical foster care. And uh, so we're excited about that. Other than that, everybody else, anything else I'm missing? Anything? If you can let us know, if you haven't signed up, let the office know so we can plan accordingly for our ministry worker luncheon and for our new members fellowship. Anything else? All right, grief share. Uh, tomorrow, Faith Bible, to Tuesday, visitation. Wednesday, 226 in church. Thursday, are you? Full week ahead. Let's make a difference in somebody's life this week. God bless you. I love you. Let's all stand together, and you're dismissed.